In the message today, it's really quite simple, but it's a very foundational truth. I will have a lot more to say built on what I'm saying today. I think you know it, but I want, to, I want it driven into our hearts so that we really get it, not just sort of know it. It's a truth we stand on. It's a truth we, we fight from as we deal with the attacks and assaults and all that come against us. It's a, it's, this is a rock that you and I have to have firmly placed a foundation stone in our building. And that's what we want God to work in today. Father God, would you open your word? Would you open our hearts? We feed on your word. It's, it's bread to our soul. Lord, without the revelation, without the light of your word, we would wander in darkness. We would sin against you. But David said, thy word I have hidden my heart that I might not sin against you. So Lord, we hide the word in our heart. We would obey the word that we might be blessed. That we might, that we might serve you and be effective. And I pray for grace that this word, Lord, would come through me so we hear your voice and not mine. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we'll start with our discussion guide. <clears throat> if, I've, if I've given my heart to Christ, why do such ugly thoughts still go through my head? You wouldn't think that anyone with Jesus living inside could think these things. It's not that I want to be depressed or think violent, violent sensual, angry, or fearful thoughts. They seem to come from nowhere. Suddenly, there I am thinking or feeling such things, and when I realize what's happening, I grow angry at myself and frightened. How can something like that still dwell in my heart? Apparently, there's still something evil or crazy inside of me. Now, I'm not going to ask for any hands. I just want you to know I assume that goes through your head. It's what I think of you. It's what I think of people. It's what goes, it's, I think this is human. And I think it's what Christians go through, but we don't talk about it. We always play this game that everything is fine. And these are the hidden things that you think, I don't dare let anyone know this. They'd lock me up. All right. Yes, we would. So keep your mouth shut. <laughs> I think all of us have experienced this type of in, internal conversation. Perverse and, and tempting thoughts seem to arise out of the hidden recesses of our minds and leave us wondering if that's where, what we're really like deep down inside. And unless we get, let God's word show us the true source of these things and the profound change that Jesus has made in us, we can be deceived into owning impulses that come from the world, the flesh, and the devil. Where do they come from? Yes, they do. But you'd be surprised how, how, how people will own that and assume it's coming from the darkness of their own heart. And if we buy the lie that those things arise from our own heart, we don't stand a chance of becoming free. But Jesus said, you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. Would you read that with me? You will know the truth and the truth will make you free. Let's look at Romans 17, uh, pardon me, 7, verse 14. This is what Paul's describing. And he, it's hard to put it in better words than he does. I'm not going to exposit all of this. I'm going to just, but just let it kind of, let, let, let the clear statements of what he says uh, make sense to us. Verse 14. But we know that the law is spiritual, the, the, the word of God, the Bible, the standards of the Bible. But I'm a flesh sold into bondage to sin. For what I'm doing, I don't understand. For I, I'm not practicing what I'd like to do, but I'm doing the very thing I hate. But if I do the very thing I don't want to do, I agree with the law, God's word, confessing that it's good. So now, no longer am I the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. Did you hear him? What he's saying is, listen, if I wanted to do this, I would. But my own heart doesn't want to do these things. My heart wants to obey him. So what is it, what's up, that I got things at work in me, making me do stuff I don't want to do? For I know that nothing good dwells in me. Now notice this distinction here. That is in my what? Say flesh again. 
Yeah, he's not saying it doesn't, nothing good dwells in his heart. He's saying nothing good dwells in his flesh. His flesh, in other words, the stuff of his body and, and, and all. But the, for the willing is present in me, but the doing of the good is not. What did Jesus say in the Garden of Gethsemane? For either spirit is willing, but the flesh is... Yeah. He said the same thing to his disciples as he was telling them to worship before they were about to be assaulted big time. For the good that I want, verse 19, I do not do, but practice the very evil I don't want. But if I am doing the very thing I do not want, I am no longer the one doing it. But sin, which dwells in me. I find then the principle that evil is present in me, the one who wants to do good. For I joyfully concur with the law of God in the inner man, but I see a different law in the members of my what? Waging war against the law of my mind, my spirit, making me a prisoner of the law of sin, which is in my what? Yeah. Wretched man that I am, who set me free from the body of this death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then on the one hand, I myself with my mind am serving the law of God, but on the other, with my flesh, the... Do you see him make the distinction? He's telling us something very important. He's about to step into Romans 8 and he'll tell us key principles of victory. How to do this. But you got to get what he said clear. And you would say, well, sure, I got it. I got it, Pastor. Let's move on. No, you don't. <laughs> Not like you're going <clears> to. <throat> Go with me to Ephesians chapter 2. I want to show you the old you. We're going to look at the old you, and then we're going to look at the new you. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians. Now, this isn't Romans, but Paul wrote it. And I, I can't find any place that he lays it out so succinctly as here in Ephesians 2. Here Paul identifies four major sources that influence every person who is not born again. So we're looking at a person who is not born again. Verse 1. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked according to the course of this, say world, according to the prince of the power of the air, who's that? Of the, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. I'll explain. Among them, these disobedient uh, society, we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of our flesh and of the mind see in a fallen person it's in the mind too and we're by nature children of wrath even as the rest I see four, th four things there four sources do you the world and by the world he's talking about collective deception and the evil patterns of behavior you and I are born into cultures and societies and they have varying amounts of evil and deception in them. I mean, imagine being born in, in, in Germany in the early 1930s. And you've got all of this rising up, this Nazism and all of the awful stuff. And you're just a kid, man. You're born of this and mommy and daddy buy this. And you go to church and they teach it. And then you go to, you go to your, your Boy Scout troop. And this is what you're taught. Poor kid, you don't have a chance. You're raised in a culture, in a world, in a society, in a value system. You're just having it pumped into you from the day you're born. You see it? Evil is not just individual. Evil is collective. Deception comes into cultures. Is it in ours? Woohoo. Stay tuned. Who knows why this thing's going? But you can just watch the deception, the confusion, the value systems getting all swirled. Huge numbers, millions and millions of people swaying along, being taken with the tide. We're born, we're, we live in a world, in a collective deception. Then he mentions the prince of the power of the air. 
And, and I'll have another, I have much more to say on these things, but that's the devil. And it's the, why does he think it's the air? I don't think it's because he, he, rules, he rules gas. I, I think it's because he is there, but he's not seen. It's like someone, it's like the air whispers to you. It's like the air is just there. He's, he's, he's the prince of the power that you can't see. Deception and temptation are his tools. Then he mentions something and he says it so beautifully. The spirit that's now working in the sons of disobedience. Sons of disobedience, just Hebrew poetry, among disobedient people. What is that spirit? It's the Adam, Adam's nature. Say Adam's nature. Yeah, it's that proud independence and rebellion that you were born with. And so was I. And then he mentions in verse 3, the lusts of our flesh. And he's talking there about the appetites, the weakness of our bodies and the influence that our bodies have on us. So this means that we are born into a world in which our parents, friends, teachers, governments, and even religions are controlled to one degree or another by ambition, pride, greed, fear, and lust. And then when we look inside ourselves, we find strong impulses to resist anyone who tells us no and decide right from wrong for ourselves. Even our bodies seem to have a mind of their own. Emotions and desires surge through us so constantly they wear us down by their relentless pressure. And whenever we're tired or lonely or discouraged, these grow even more intense. They strike in moments when we're too weak to resist. And if all this weren't bad enough, terrible thoughts can enter our minds that seem to come out of nowhere. It's like someone unseen whispered in my ear or was able to project an image onto the screen of my mind. The thoughts themselves disgust me, but more than that, they frighten me. I, believe I, was a be I believed I was a better person than that. This is the situation into which every new baby is born. So it should come as no surprise that in time we all succumb to these forces which are arrayed against us. But God, because he loves us, made a way to escape. Can you see the, 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 the situation that the human race is born into? Those are the forces arrayed against us, Paul says. Every child, your, your, your baby, was born into that. And that's the world that little sweetheart was born into. Even with that infection of rebellion. But you can just, this, into this thing we come. And we're dropped, and then you wonder why we all sin. <laughs> yeah, like, Right. How would you not? But there's a new you. Somebody say, thank heavens. Thank you. Roman, <clears throat> why don't you read these verses out loud with me? Romans 8.10. If Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, yet the spirit is alive because of righteousness. Now he's talking about a Christian, isn't he? Christ is in you, though the body is dead dead. The body is not redeemed yet. Your body, you got one unredeemed body and you knew that or you suspected it. But you're, so the spirit in me is alive, but my body's dead. You following this? Second Corinthians 5 17, Paul says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. This, this thing gets misunderstood, this, this verse. And, and people, I think King James kind of helped it along. Didn't King James say, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creature. Behold, old things have passed away. All things have become new. And boy, does that puppy get preached. And, and you say, look, see, everything's new now that you're a Christian. And so I'm, where I'm about to head and what I'm about to describe is the, the temptations, the struggles, the issues that we face. If, if, if any of that was true on that first page of introduction that I read to you, where you felt those things and thought those things and thought, what is wrong with me? Then what's the question if all things have become new? Then I have to, then I have to ask myself, 
did I turn off my phone? No. <laughs> I actually did ask myself that. I saw that. I thought, it's mine over there. Anyway. I, just, I was just at a church yesterday, and, and they put up on the screen, and it said, uh, uh, please remember to turn your phone back on after service. <laughs> How is that for an indirect suggestion? Now, where was I? Someplace really good. Huh? Old things have passed away. All things have become new. So where, what's that leave me with? Then I must not be saved, because all things aren't new. So I guess I'm not saved. You see where it goes? If, 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 you don't, if, if this isn't discussed, if this isn't faced honestly, it leaves people feeling condemned and hopeless. That's where this thing goes. It's, it's really a serious matter. All right. The, the, I, I didn't read you uh, Galatians 2.20. Let's do that one together. I have been crucified with Christ, and it's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. Amen. The key, que the key question in all of this is what actually changes when I become born again. And what does not. What does Paul mean when he says new things have come? Because I still face most of these enemies. And to be honest, still lose my share of battles against them. What's new? Goodbye, sweetie. What, what's new and what's not. Hey, I'm glad she said goodbye. She's a little sweetheart. <laughs> I still face most of these enemies, and to be honest, still lose my share of battles against them. What's new and what's not? Let's go down the list of the old you and see what's changed. Okay? We'll check it off. Do you still live in the midst of, a co of collective evil? Yeah, well, do you live... You need to move, obviously. <laughs> Yeah, well, so do we. Is, is, is uh, Satan still allowed to tempt and trouble you? Yes. Huh. Okay. Let's go down to number three. Flesh, has your body appetites all submitted themselves to God's standards? Uh, does your, does, or does it still have a mind of its own? Are you grumpy when you're tired? Now we're down to the fourth one, and here's where, here's where things change. Look at this. Adam's nature. Am I still independent and rebellious toward God? No, I am not. No, I'm not. I am crucified with Christ, and Christ lives in me. That's the part that's changed. You see it? Now I love him. When I surrendered to him, when I repented and gave up control, and I said, God, I want you to be my Lord. My spirit, the most essential part of me said, Lord, I surrender to you. I trust you. I give my life to you. And I want you to see that's the new you. That's the essence of your spirit. When you become born again, that changes. You are not Adam's child in your spirit anymore. That that whatever that is that we inherited, whether it's demonic or genetic, I don't know. I think, I, but that thing was broken, Amen. and I am now free. I'm new inside. So what's changed is that I have, by an act of my will, repentance, ended my independence and rebellion toward God. Now I love him and want him to help me and guide me. Do you agree with that? In fact, I want to live to serve him and not for myself anymore. Do you agree with that? Mm -hmm. Yes, the world, the flesh, and the devil are still there. They haven't become new. Not even your body. It's not redeemed yet. It will be at the resurrection. And you will have, in the resurrection, a spiritual body, which doesn't mean you're, it's made of spirit, but it's submitted to the spirit. Your body will cooperate. Amen. Won't that be lovely? No more dragging this donkey around with you. Yeah. All right. But the body will not. But it's not there yet. 
The world, the flesh, and the devil are still there, but my deep attitudes and relationship with God has entirely changed. Something else has happened. Because I am joined to Jesus Christ, God has come and now dwells inside of me, bringing with me him, pardon me, bringing with him an unlimited supply of wisdom, goodness, and strength, far greater than any of the enemies I face. What's changed? My spirit's changed. I am no longer a rebel. I am no longer desiring to be independent. I am now a child of God. I love him. I depend on him. And I want to follow and serve him. That's my will. That's my heart. When that happened, when Christ, when Christ, because of Christ, he has come and now dwells within me, joined to my spirit. And so I have a changed will, a changed essence of spirit. I'll, say, I'll talk to you a little bit more in a minute. And I have been joined now by the person of God himself inside me. That's what's new. It's a pretty good amount. Body, soul, and spirit. Let's look at the old and new me another way. Now, I don't think I need to go over this because I say it a lot. But in Genesis, God says, let's make man in our image and likeness. And then in chapter 2, he, he says, he made man, formed man from the dust of the earth. And he breathed into his nostrils and Adam became a living nephesh, uh, the same exact term that is used for the animals. Because a living, they were too, were living nepheshes. The body of Adam is, is the dust. Often people think that when God breathed into Adam's nostrils, he breathed spirit into him. He did not. He breathed life into him. He also, I don't know if he breathed into them, I don't know how he did it, but he put life into animals. All life, all life is on loan from God. That's why God has so much concern about blood. The life is in the blood. The blood, he will give you the body of the animal to eat, you will not take the life, the life's his. Blood in all cases is to be honored and respected and treated. You never treat it shabbily. Why? Because life is in it and he has, it, life comes from him. And he doesn't give life, he loans it. So the soul of a person is often taught in Christian circles as the, as the, as the intellect, will, and emotions. And it's very wrong, I think. It is not. It's the breath. It's the life. The spirit of a person is that we are made in God's image. A conscious, rational, eternal person with intellect, will, and emotions. Our intellect, will, and emotions are what form our basic personality. And therefore, the essential me. In other words, they express my spirit. People often use the term heart for this. This is who I am. This is my, my heart. It's important to remember that God himself also has Intellect, will, and emotions. Does he not? God, you, have, you see God in the Bible uh, uh, joying over us, singing. You see him grieving. You see him angry. He has emotions. Intellect, my goodness. Uh, his, 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 his mental capacity is just beyond uh, our understanding. His will, does he have a will? Oh, yeah, I think so. So it's important to remember that God himself also has intellect, will, and emotions. In fact, we have them because he made us in his image. That's why you have them, is because you're made like him. This means these are spiritual qualities, not byproducts of our bodies. You're not an animal processing things. You are spirit. We are spiritual beings who live in bodies, actually live through bodies. Eternal persons who began at conception, but then continue to exist forever. Before I surrendered to Christ, every part of me was damaged and getting worse. But when the essential me, my spirit, pressed and helped by the Holy Spirit, 
chose to repent and believe, that spirit became new. No longer rebellious or independent. I am now a loving, obedient child of God. Would you say that? I am now a loving, obedient child of God. Yet surprisingly, parts of my intellect and emotions can still remain damaged. My intellect, my attitudes and patterns of thinking has areas that need to be renewed by God's word and his fatherly training. When I get saved, I can still have bad thinking. Can't I? You've noticed. I can have things that were programmed into me, taught me, attitudes that were put there, that God has to father out of me. The word of God has to bring light on and show me the wrongness of it. You too? So my, my, my spirit, my essential spirit's intact and loves him. And it involves my intellect and will. But even my intellect is clouded with the old damage. And has to be renewed. Romans 12, 2. Be renewed by the transforming of your, your mind. Yeah. And, and then my emotions. How about yours? Can, I can still retain damage from things that were done to me. I can retain damage from things I did to others. I mean, that hurts as much as the things that were done to me. So I have emotional damage that has to be healed as well. So it's not like even that very inner part of me is whole, but it's now surrendered and in love with God. And that's what changes everything. I have to unlearn a number of wrong things and learn to think new things. And my emotions usually need to be healed too because I still carry wounds from my past. But my will has submitted to Christ. So he who began a good work in me will continue to perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Does that make sense? In conclusion. In future weeks, we will talk about ways to deal with those influences we still face from the world. Pardon me. From the world, the flesh, and the devil. Are they still there? Yeah, you're not crazy. There's not something wrong with you, and it doesn't mean you're not saved. In fact, some of these things actually ramp up and get worse when you're saved. Oh, great. But, but the resources God gives us are far greater, and we are... We are set free by them. So don't be afraid of that. But, but today we focused on the most important truth of all. That when you and I repent and believe in Jesus Christ, our spirit becomes new. We have a whole new nature that hates sin and wants to obey God. So these temptations and impulses that still come are not arising out of the depths of our hearts. Say that with me. These temptations, temptations and impulses, excuse me, I'll start again. These temptations and impulses that still come are not arising out of the depths of our hearts. They are attacks coming from outside our spirit. This makes all the difference in the world. Once that realization becomes part of my thinking, the devil's important tool of shame is broken. Now I'm able to rise up and using God's weapons, fight and win. Let's say it again. You will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. I'm not going to any of the details, but you've, you know what it is. Along come the thoughts. Along come the impulses. Along comes the atti attitudes. You've, 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 and, you, and you just can't believe that. And then comes the, the, then comes the dangerous thought. Man, that came out of me. I'm awful. Who, what's wrong with me? I'm sick. And the devil has actually 
lobbed this sucker over the walls. The impulses of the flesh had brought these. But if you believe, if you do not recognize what Christ has done and, what, and, the, and, the, and the reality that the, the, the old self is crucified with Christ and who lives in you now is Christ joined to you. If you don't get that truth and you are trying to cleanse your heart, you're doomed. If you recognize your heart loves him, you are a child of God, and this is coming from outside in, not inside up. Did I make it clear? Yes. If you get that clear, you'll fight the fight, you'll use his weapons, and you'll win. If you don't see it, none of the rest of this works. Father, would you sear this into our understanding? The power and the reality of Jesus Christ and what he's done for us is glorious. Jesus, you have taken rebellious children, spirits, and you have called to us, and you have given us the power by the Spirit that we can come to you and repent. And choose to submit our hearts to you. And lives to you. And now. We are new inside. Our heart is not. Sinister. And rebellious. Our heart is not the source of this evil. We're in a world. Full of this junk. But greater is he. Who is in us than he who is in the world. Far greater, much greater, overwhelmingly greater is he who is in us and who will never leave us, who began a good work in us and will continue to perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Far greater, overwhelmingly greater. So whom the Son sets free is indeed free. And we believe it, we confess it, and we thank you, Jesus, that we are new. I am new I am new inside because of you. Just with your heads bowed for one moment, I, just, I should ask this question before I, before I go to the next thing because it's very important. I've assumed tonight that, that in all of this that you're a Christian, not just a Christian by culture or, or, or sort of even theology, but that you have truly surrendered to Christ and repented of of your independence and of your rebellion, that you have trusted him and that you are living for him. I assume that you have embraced Jesus Christ by faith and made him your savior, believing that he died on the cross for your sins and that they're washed away by his death and his resurrection. I have assumed that, but it may not you may need to say that tonight. You may need to confess that tonight. You may need to take that step tonight and seal it. And I just want to, before I close, I'm going to just ask anyone want to raise your hand and say, Pastor, tonight, I am, I, am, I am indeed doing that. I am repenting. I am surrendering myself to Jesus Christ. I am surrendering myself to him. I am not going to be independent or rebellious from God anymore. I'm coming home. I'm coming back to him and I want him to be my Lord. I'm putting my hand in his and letting him change me and clean me. Every part of me. My finances, my, my sex life, my speech, my thoughts, my attitudes, my prejudices. He is, I am, want him to come in and cleanse me and change me until I'm like Jesus Christ. I want that. I want that. And I believe Jesus died for me to wash those sins away so that God covers me and loves me and will not forsake me or leave me while that cleaning is happening. Anyone want to raise your hand and say, Pastor, I need to confess that tonight. I need to make that step. Yes, God bless you. Yes, the Lord be with you. Yes, this is it. This is how you do it. Yes, this is where it begins. Blessed be the Lord. Right here. Do you notice the covering you have in Jesus? This is a salvation. If you choose to be saved, you choose to come back to him, he has made a way for you. You don't have to say, I'm too weak, I can't do this. He's there for you. His grace is sufficient for you. Yes, you can. 
The only person that can prevent it is you. And the only person that can open the door and welcome him is you. One more request. Anyone else tonight? Yes. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. All right, church, let's pray. And those who've raised your hands, we're, just, we're going to invite him in now. We're going to surrender. He's here listening. And you speak with your heart now and tell him these things. Dear Heavenly Father, I love you. I acknowledge that I have been independent. I didn't want anybody telling me no. I've lived my own life and I've lived for myself, my own glory, my own pleasures. But I'm through with it. With my heart, I choose tonight to surrender to Jesus Christ. I want him to be my Lord. I want to be changed. You may, have, you may change every area of my life. I want you to. I want you to clean me and transform me. I want my values, my goals, my loves, my hates. I want them to all change and become like you. Come, dear one. Be my Lord and Father with my heart as you empower me. I will follow Jesus Christ. I believe in you with all my heart. I believe you are the Son of God. And when you died on the cross, you were punished. You bore the, you bore the, 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 the sin of the whole world. I believe that. And tonight I receive it. You died for my sin. All of it, all the selfish, cruel, ugly things I've done or thought. You died for it all. Because of what you did, I am washed clean. I believe it. And I will trust you to the day I die. Thank you that you keep washing me clean. That you will cover me with your righteousness for as long as I live. Tonight, I call you my Lord. I call you my Savior. And I welcome the Holy Spirit to dwell inside of me, to be my strength, my wisdom, my goodness, to take care of me and train me to be your child the rest of my life. Come, Holy Spirit, with your great power. Welcome in and dwell in me as a living temple. In the mighty name of Jesus, I pray this. And I mean it with all my heart. Amen. Praise you, Jesus. Lord, we thank you for every person that prayed that. We thank you for every sincere heart. Lord Jesus, you have given us eternal life. We who have the Son have life, and we bless you, our Lord. We love you. In your mighty name we pray, amen.